Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, you're going to have two amazing lectures uh, in this uh, session. Um, I'm CJ Lim, I'm Professor of Architecture and Urbanism, I'm also Vice Dean of Rathbun. For those who are new to the school, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Now, uh, tonight gives me enormous, enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Adams. I met Rob um, when I was in Melbourne only a few months ago. Um, and I can tell you a lot about it. My meeting with Rob and how supportive he was with our research and the work we did out there um, and, and so forth. But I'm not going to do that. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to say is that, you know, tonight you will discover sustainability green in a different light completely. Um, I've met a lot of interesting, innovative designers and environmentalists, sustainable engineers, I've worked with a lot of them. But when we first met Rob that evening in Melbourne, when he took us to his building, the CH2 building, and when we got sort of literature of his books, read, Rob is one of the truly inspiring people I've ever known. And I've, I've met many, many of those, but truly, uh, he was truly, truly amazing. Um, I could have, me and my team could have listened to him the whole day, just talking about sustainability and the amazing, amazing work that he and his team has done for the city of Melbourne. And they were just not projects, but they were real. They were realized projects, and those were projects that made a great, great difference to the city. Um, and if you, for those of you who have now been to Melbourne, you go there now, you find it is an amazing city, and a lot of it is due to what Robin's team has uh, done. So, I'm going to read a little bit of what Rob has done. Um, Rob is currently the Director of City Design at the City of Melbourne and the Vice Chair of Urbanization Council of the World Economic Forum. Um, he, he has 40 years of experience as an architect and urban designer and 30 years at the City of Melbourne. Rob has made significant contribution to the rejuvenation of Melbourne. He has a team has been the recipient of over 120 local, national, and international awards, including four occasions receiving the Australian Award for Urban Design. Rob has himself been awarded the Prime Minister's Environmentalist of the Year Award in 2008, the Order of Australia in 2007, uh, for his contribution to architecture and urban design. As I said, he will be showing snippets of CH2, the building that I've been sort of raving about and talking about in tutorials and seminars, um, among other projects. Uh, his current interest concerns the health and sustainability of the metro city, and welcome, Rob, to UCL. <coughs> Thank you, CJ, and thank you for the opportunity of coming and speaking to you tonight. I'm just going to put the lights down because they're going to uh, film this, and uh, apparently it's better for the images. This really uh, is a talk in two parts. Uh, it, it looks back 25 years, and uh, towards the end it looks forward 25 years. The, the situation we're fac facing, as we all know, is most of us live in cities. In fact, about 50% of us, or 3.5 billion people, live in cities. The thing you might not realize is that over the next uh, 40 years, or 35 years, that's going to raise to 6.4 billion. It means we're going to almost double the urban capacity of the planet in about 35 years. Now, clearly, we're not going to do that using the same arrangements that we've used up until now. The other thing that surprises me, and I, I leave here on Saturday to go to Dubai to the World Economic Forum, is people are not talking about cities. Yet, 70% of the world's populations will live in cities by 2050. 75 to 80% of the greenhouse gases come out of cities and 70 to 80% of the GDP. If we don't solve the problem with cities, we can't solve the problem of climate change 
and a lot of us are going to be in a very miserable situation. So we need to talk about them, and we need to talk about them at a national and international scale. I think cities are places of hope, and this comes from Doug Saunders' book, Why Are They Places of Hope? Because when people move to cities, they acquire skills, and also you find their population decreases. I'm being told to drop my voice slightly. Sorry, I'm shouting. <laughs> it's nervousness. So the best thing that can happen is if people move to cities, gain the skills, and lower the family numbers, population control will come un un under control. In 2006, I was lucky enough to do, uh, have a sabbatical, and I was employed by the European Union to look at cities that have transformed themselves. And I'm optimistic that we can transform cities. I won't go through all of the cities. I, I studied 12. But I'll give you an example of how s some cities have transformed themselves. Glasgow, in the 1970s, was moving its population to the fringe. It was failing as a city. In 1985, it started to move the population back downtown. And what happened with that is a rejuvenation of that city, more people going into tertiary education, and the city was actually the cultural capital of Europe one year. So concentration rather than decentralization was the strategy for Glasgow. And you must really know of many of the projects of pedestrianization that have occurred there. Bordeaux had a different strategy. Bordeaux's strategy was about a high quality public realm, making the public realm of the city so attractive that people wanted to live there. Introducing a tram system that had no overhead wires, it actually had a third rail, worked on induction. And 190,000 people use a tram system today that wasn't there 15, 20 years ago. So high quality public space, good buildings, good infrastructure was what encouraged people to come back and live in Bordeaux. Berlin has long had a strategy of a height control put in place by Hans Stimmen. It saw the energy of that city retained by keeping the buildings low and close to the street. It's not a popular strategy, and it's one that architects often argue against, and you can see that debate going on in London today. But it's one that has been successful in many cities. Cities that actually, where the street is the most important public space, and therefore the way buildings interact with the street becomes a primary importance. Malmo was another city that used a different strategy. In 1985, the shipping industry left Malmo to go to Korea, and with that, 46% of the population were out of work. They had three strategies. They bought a university downtown, they built a bridge to Copenhagen, and they produced this very advanced piece of urbanism, a piece of urbanism where they capture their own water, generate their own energy. And the important thing about this is that people could go and visit what the future looked like. And when they go there, they find the future familiar. It's not an unfamiliar future. And a lot of what I'd like to tell you tonight is really we need to, in fact, start in talking about the future in the way that it's going to be, not in theoretical ways, so that people become comfortable with the future and its sustainability. These are some of the spaces you get in uh, Bonalit, which is uh, in the docklands of uh, Malmo. Dublin, almost by mistake, put in place a strategy based on culture. They had an area of Dublin, Temple Bar, that was going to be a, a public transport interchange. They put students in there on, on uh, low rentals, short leases, and what students did is they went to the pubs, they enjoyed themselves, they started uh, a cultural revolution. And in fact, what the Glaswegian, uh, sorry, the Dubliners uh, realized is that they could put cultural institutions in and that would regenerate that part of the city. So they built 12 cultural institutions, from film schools to uh, the ARC, which is where young kids go and work with artists, and it completely re reformed that part of the city. There were two cities that weren't in Europe that I put in. One was Melbourne and the other was Bogota. And the reason I put in Bogota was because of two mayors, Mokas and Enrique Penaloza. In the short time that they were mayors, each of them was there for three years, they completely transformed Bogota with incredible courage. What they did is they started to invest in social infrastructure. They didn't spend a single dollar on the motor car in the six years they were in office. What they did is they built rapid bus, bike, pedestrians, parks, libraries, and they dropped the crime rate in Bogota by about 86%. A courageous effort 
to in fly in the face of what was happening in that city. And there have been other courageous cities, Seoul and Korea. There's a river underneath this freeway, and for the Olympics they dropped that road and returned their river to their city. The same happened in Aarhus, just outside Copenhagen. Underneath that street where the green truck is, is a river. They, in fact, brought their river back, and with that, they brought the population back. Cities survive if people use them and make them safe places. People are the heartblood of all cities. So in Melbourne, we had the challenge in 1985. This was, or sorry, in 1980, this was the uh, article that was being written about Melbourne. Like many cities, people were deserting the centre and going to the suburbs. The challenge that we were given in 1983 was to write a strategy to turn that round. And it's a strategy about livability as well as sustainability. And I think both of those things are one and the same thing. What we looked at, and I won't go through all of the strategy because we haven't got the time, but what we looked at is the major elements of the city and looked at how we could transform them. And the, and the centre of Melbourne was settled on a river Ship sailed up the river. You can see in the top slide a waterfall that, uh, where they stopped, a natural turning basin, and that's where the port grew up. And the port was part of the city. You had the continuity of streets running down to the city. There was a fish market, um, and you could easily access that waterway. By the 1970s, what had happened has happened in many cities. The fish market had been knocked down for a road that went over a street. You can see it just up here, to take you from one traffic night to the next. Car parks had been put where the, where the fish market was. The fabric of the city had been uh, destroyed. So our challenge was, how did we bring that back? How did we reconnect the city with the river? And a lot of the infrastructure you couldn't take down. And what I'll be talking about a lot tonight is transformation. I think we've got to use the stuff we've got better than we, uh, we are at the moment. So rather than pull this rather unimpressive structure down, we lowered the ground level, these are the power caps, we changed that profile of the line, uh, land and we put a single blue light along there so we got the sculptural effect at night. And with a very simple strategy, we got a, a far more elegant river. We also started to plan to cut the river back closer to the streets and to build underneath the rail viaduct as they had with the fish market. And in that way, return the streets to the previous form. We also proposed to take down the bridge that ran over that street there. So you can see what we had in 1985. The first strategy in 1998 was cutting of the turning basin back in and the building of the first building here and removal of roads and car parks from these areas here. Then with the Commonwealth Games in 2005, we managed to convince the state government to pull down this road that went over and we returned the street back down to grade and with that, we were able to build in the remaining site and get back to the stage where we had a street running through here and two streets that ran down underneath the viaduct to the river. Mending a city is a slow process. Incrementalism is the ph a philosophy that I believe in. A lot of small actions over a long period of time. The same happened with our central city. When I arrived there in 1983 and was asked to write the urban design strategy, the first drawing I did was this one. It was a Noli map, and what we looked at was what were the spaces that were accessible 24 hours. And I was hearing the story about how marvellous Melbourne was, was being in, in, in eroded. And I thought that was about the architecture. But as I started to talk to people, I discovered it was really about the way the city was changing in its morphology. The blocks of Melbourne were very large. They were laid out with 200 metres across the bottom and 100 metres up, 10 metre streets running through the middle and 20 metre streets below that. In the 19th century, what happened is those, those blocks were subdivided and in the subdivision, they started to put lanes and arcades that ran through to give access through these blocks. The railway station was to the south, so people moved up through these blocks. And what was happening at the latter part of the 20th century is that structure was being changed. This building, uh, designed by a very well-known architect, I.M. Pei, in fact consolidated a lot of these blocks, had a single entrance, and internalised itself from the street. And that was the way things were done in the 1960s and 70s. So what you got is previously you had a street like this, and this is the street you inherited. Well, you've only got to do that about 20 or 30 times to a city, and you kill it. 
So we, we developed a policy of not allowing developers or architects to destroy our streets. And we started to have a policy that you had to, in fact, have 75% of the street active, open back into the buildings. And this is the same shot a few years later where we had encouraged the developers to open back, open back that street. We, built a, uh, we bought a block of uh, the city where there used to be a hospital. We put together a strategy of redevelopment that basically said we wanted lanes and arcades, we wanted open space, and we didn't want a single architect as the developer of that. So there were seven different architects that worked on this. And what we got was a modern piece of Melbourne that functioned, had a supermarket below ground, um, childcare centres, residential, and a mixed-use piece of urbanism. So we try to illustrate through becoming a developer at one level what you could do in a city like Melbourne. <coughs> Fed Square won the competition in many ways because it was a, a modern interpretation of Melbourne. It had the lanes and arcades that ran through. It also produced our first public space. Melbourne had never had a major square within the city. Once we got the developers working to recreate our streets, our challenge then became how did we build back some public space into the city? And this in many ways typifies our approach. This tiny little space, you can see the 3D model we did here, was a tiny little square without any activity on it. What we did is we cut a hole in the town hall. There used to be a window, we made it into a door. We put a flower cellar on the corner with a very low rental, but he had to stay there till 10 o'clock at night. We designed this little cafe and put it out to tender. It was paid for by a private developer. And we, we just paved the streets in quality of paving. What happened was that little corner started to come back to life. And we did that around the town. This was a traffic island that we built as a, a, as a celebration of our Chinese community and our sister city, Tianjin. This was our city square that had been built uh, back in the early 80s. Had won an award, was opened by the Queen. But what the secret of public space is not what you put in the middle. This had a water wall, it had an amphitheater, it had a screen. It had all the gimmicks that go into these places. What it didn't have was people. People come from what happened around the edge of a space. So what we did is we sold off this part of the square. We reinvested the money in this theater that had been dark for 25 years and we produced a much smaller space. A smaller space that's surrounded by cafes and restaurants and is now used by people on an everyday basis. Small spaces are much easier to design than big spaces. So if in doubt, just halve the space and it'll most probably be working far better than a big space. And put some, put some activity around the edge. So this is what was happening. So in 1983 when we started, these were some of our public spaces, 2004, we'd increased the number of public spaces that were available. We also started to work on the character of Melbourne and, and build a city that would last not for 10, 15 years, but for 100 years and 200 years. So we decided there'd be only one paving material in the city. It was the local stone called bluestone. And we started to require all developers to use this stone for paving. And this is what we had in 1985 in terms of bluestone. And this is what we had by 2004. So the streets became very easy streets to walk on. And we could add to those signage, cafes, trees, and art. But the pavement became something that was easy to maintain and pr provided a good walking surface. And these were some of the artworks that went in. Some of them were, in fact, infrastructure. This was a ventilation shaft where they were going to put a concrete pipe in. And we said, no, you better work with an artist. So, we also have temporary installations, laneways. Uh, every year we commission four or five artists to put an installation into one of our laneways. It'll stay there uh, for about five months and then we'll take it out and have new artwork the next year. And street art has become a very big part of Melbourne's culture. And we encourage street art and try and actually encourage people to be productive in their street art rather than tagging. We've also designed a range of furniture that's very distinctive to Melbourne. So one of our principles is a local character. And this is a range of furniture, poster bollards, uh, places where people uh, have city tours, um, a toilet, and also telephones operate off the microcell here. And this was paid for by Optus. Um, and it's an information system for the city. 
This is one of the little booths, and this started off as a news booth, but uh, with newspapers changing, this is no longer a news booth, and it's now become a tiny little crepery where they actually sell crepes through the day. So the, the structure is able to be adapted for those different use, uses. And we designed street furniture that would last and also be distinctive to Melbourne. Some of the details are, this seat here was for the Bali Memorial, and it was symbolic of a wave. Uh, which sy symbolized, uh, there's a water element in front of this that you can't see, symbolized uh, the young people that died on that occasion. This is a recent uh, addition to our street in Swanson Street where we, we uh, changed uh, the arrangements, and I'll show you that in a moment, but a new street light that's very low energy um, and lines that street. And some funny little details that just actually add a bit of joy to the city. And we plant trees. We plant trees in just about every spot that we can plant a tree. You can see some before and afters there, and you can see the trees we've planted in our central city since 1993. And I'll come back to that because uh, as you're experiencing with your ashes, we're experiencing with our trees. And one of our challenges is what is the urban forest of the future? And one of our other secrets was to realize that people in Melbourne love their coffee. So we used coffee, coffee as one of the strategies to get people on the streets. We designed street stalls to take fruit, coffee stalls, flowers. 1983, there were two sidewalk cafes. 1993, 2004, and we now have 400 street cafes in the central city. So the streets are now safe because people use the streets as a place to, in fact, enjoy their coffee. One of the other strategies was to start to steal back the street from the motor car. We have a very strong motor car culture, and if you went out with a strategy that said we're going to steal it back from the, uh, the motorist, you wouldn't have been successful. So we just quietly, over the last 30 years, took 30 hectares of asphalt out of the central city. Just by widening footpaths, putting medians down the middle, you can see here we took parking off one side of the street here, and with that extra width added the paving to each side of the footpath, just to make it a slightly easier place to walk. And with that, retailing started to come back, because people could actually stop and look into shops and therefore increase their retailing ability. Lanes and arcades that I'd shown you in those early city, uh, slides, we gave people the right to, in fact, use those as a commercial venture. We rented out at about uh, $60 a square meter per year, a very low rental, but they have to do it at a high quality. And that's, that means we get a lot of sidewalk cafes. And now we've started, as you have in London, to in fact use bicycles as one of our major forms of transport. And this is the bicycle network that we've created over the last 10 years. These are some of the projects that are going in this year. And each year we have quite a handsome budget to improve the, the bicycle network. This is a bridge we designed to get uh, bicycle commuters uh, over a, a, a railway line. And this was one of the early d divided uh, bike lanes that we've had, a bit crude, and the later ones are much better. So we've moved since uh, 2002 from 1% of the commuters coming into our city, uh, central city, to 10% by 2011. And, and cycling has become a very, a very rich part of our culture. We closed the main road through the center of the city to, to motor vehicles. That was as much a psychological thing as it was uh, about sustainability. The street was dying. You can see the footpaths were narrow. The retailing was very mediocre. So what we did is we added three and a half meters to each of the footpaths. We planted 100 trees. And what happened is over the next 10 years, we doubled the pedestrian numbers in that street. There are now 45,000 pedestrians that walk down that street each day. And retailing has become one of the stronger, stronger parts of, or that street is one of the stronger retailing streets uh, within Melbourne. We've just recently completed a further upgrade where at four spots along the street, we widened the footpaths right out to the tram lines. And we usually did it where there was a public square. So this is in front of our library. And the only people who can go through here are pedestrians, bikes, and trams. The cars are completely excluded from those parts of the street. They can get into the other areas of the street for servicing, but in these four piece, places, they, they, they don't come, so they don't drive through. And this is the street furniture and the general feeling of those tram stops at night. 
One of the most successful strategies we had was called Postcode 3000. And when we started this in 1983, our challenge was how do we bring people back to live in Melbourne? Because I was told Australians don't live in cities or in downtown. So what we did is we devised a plan uh, at the end of uh, the 1980s when the property market crashed and we gave incentives for developers to build residential. And little buildings like this that had been left in receivership were bought up, well, the, the banks uh, repossessed them and with Macquarie Bank, we converted this into 35 apartments. And with that, people saw that living in the city was a possibility. It was also financially very viable and quite uh, attractive. Old buildings like this were converted to residential. This building, you can see, had residential added to the top. It used to be a, a, an office building. And most of the residential that came into the central city was converted old buildings rather than new buildings. And you can see what happened. 1983, each one of those is five dwellings. 1992, 97, 2002. That dramatically changed our downtown. Suddenly we had people living downtown, we had cafes, bars, restaurants, supermarkets. And that's completely changed the feel of central Melbourne. The population age of central Melbourne is now 26 average age. 44% of the people who live downtown are students. So there's a vibrant uh, atmosphere of downtown Melbourne. The last pattern we looked at was the parks, and we've got this fantastic ring of parks that runs around our central city, almost this emerald necklace. You can see the central city here. And if you look at it, you can see this huge park that runs down the eastern side of our city, almost down to the bay. And the challenge was, how, how could we make that into a single large park, or make people realize the extent of that park? Used to have railway lines, 56 railway lines running through, two buildings that sat in front of our cathedral. And then the joint project of Federation Square, where those buildings were removed, and Federation Square was built over there, and we convinced the Premier of the day to remove all but the running lines, and they left 12 lines there. This was a drawing we did in 1986, and this was an aspirational drawing. This said what we would like to do is have this park run right around the edge of our city, rather than be a number of parks broken by railway lines. We were lucky, we got to build and design an eight hectare park in the center of the city that now made the city run down to its river and gave us a park where we could in fact have many of the major events that previously had to go into the green parks. So these are some of the statistics that we did in the first 20 years and we were about to do our 30 year um, audit in the next year. We substantially changed the city and we substantially changed the way that the newspaper started to write about the city. But the important thing, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize, is it's actually cheaper if you can bring people back into the city and utilize the infrastructure you've got rather than building new infrastructure. So the rates dropped from 13 cents in the dollar, and I haven't got the most latest year, it's down to 4 cents in the dollar. Not that we're taking less money out of the city. But of course we've got more people living there. In fact, it's cheaper to provide the services for them. We haven't built a road, yet we've more than trebled the population of our municipality. So part of what I'm going to show you next is looking at the metro area with the same strategy and how we in fact get more out of our existing infrastructure. In the year 2000, sustainability became our next objective, having spent the first uh, 15 years looking at livability, and we set ourselves some amb ambitious targets that we would in fact go back to zero emissions in our municipality by 2020, and we would lower our water consumption by 12%. We've beaten the water consumption, we've actually lowered it by 40%, but we haven't got close to the zero emissions. This was a model that we did as to where we would have to look to reduce our emissions, and one of the places was in commercial office buildings. If we could reduce the energy used by commercial office buildings by 50%, we'd drop 1.8 million tonnes of CO2 out of our atmosphere. So we, we had a strategy of solar voltaics on top of our historic market. Every building we design is low energy. This is a little, little library we designed in East Melbourne, which uses geothermal for heating and cooling, so raises the temperature of the water to 19 degrees. Um, particularly for heating, 
and uses about a third of the energy of a normal library. You can see good natural light and it has a plenum underneath with vents here that actually allow cool air to flow into the building in summer. A, bo a bowling club where we, rather than actually drill uh, 50 meters into the ground below the building, we actually ran the pipes out under the bowling green. The, the bowling green is watered from below rather than above, so you don't get too much evaporation. You can see the, the, tube, the pipes going out here, and it works on pretty much the same way as the little library. And this is a tiny little building we did as an adventure playground, green roof, recycled uh, containers. So children get to uh, play within buildings and start to tell them something about what the future could be. Even just painting a roof on this little building white reduced the temperature gain in summer. CH2 was the flagship which uh, our mayor in, in about 2004 said to me, what do we need to do to in fact turn around the way buildings are bu uh, built in uh, Australia? And I said the best thing we could do is actually build one for ourselves. I was amazed when he said yes, let's do that. And so I got, got hold of a colleague in Zimbabwe, I was born in Zimbabwe, and there was an architect I'd worked with, Mick Pierce, who designed a building in Harare called Eastgate. And Mick came and worked with us for three years, and jointly we put this building together. The, the principle of the building, it was the first six-star uh, Green Star building, which would be uh, platinum if you were in the United States. And it does many things, the buildings, but in fact, the main thing is it works with the local climate. These are temperatures in summer, and that yellow line gives you some idea of where you need to keep the temperatures within the building, around about the low 20s. And you can see the temperatures in Melbourne in January and February as very hot days and very cool nights. So what we've done is we've designed a building that used large prefabricated concrete ceilings that were made, uh, made out of a very green concrete, fly ash, um, and a low uh, cementation mix. And these became part of the ceiling and meant that we could open the windows at night and let the cool air in and cool the building down. And that saved us 20% of the energy, that very simple thing of just opening the windows and cooling the building down. We have other things, but the next most important thing about this building is the way we, we, we thought about the people. Most conventional buildings work like this. They feed the air in from the top, they swill it round, and you live within an environment of recycled air. The building we designed, the air comes in from the bottom, underneath a plenum, rises up, and you're always sitting in a fresh air environment. Your body acts like a candle. The air, fresh air goes past you. Why is this important? It's important for a number of reasons. One, you, you only have to keep the temperature at the lower levels here, because you don't feel the temperatures here if they get higher. You're always in this fresh air environment. The air is sucked out at the top and taken out of the building. And we've estimated, and it's been assessed by the CSIRO, which is our scientific body, and also uh, Adrian Lehrman from the UK here, that we've reduced absenteeism and improved productivity by 10%. That's worth $2.4 million a year. It meant we completely played for all the environmental uh, features of this building uh, within five years. This gives you some idea of how it works inside. So these are the registers. Air comes out of here, rises up goes through the gap uh, through here and exhaust it out of the belly um, to the northern face. We have chill ceilings that uh, once the concrete heats up, help us cool down the building. Um, all, all the materials are low VOC, recyclable flooring tiles. Blinds that don't cover the whole uh, window are just taken to where the glare is, so we get good natural light. And a whole lot of other features, we've got cogeneration where we generate our own energy up to 20% and recycle the heat into the building. We also recycle water out of the sewer for use in the building. It's got a roof garden and it's got gardens on each of the floors and we've just recently uh, put these into productive gardens. The other strategy we've got is while we're doing new buildings, biggest challenge is how do you convert old buildings? 
So we've got our 1,200 buildings program, and what we've done is we've actually got a special financing arrangement whereby we can give free, cheap financing to people who will retrofit their building. And we've done that by a change in legislation which gives us security against the rates on the building, which goes ahead of any mortgage borrowing. So banks will le lend uh, money for retrofitting of buildings um, at, at a very economical rate for these buildings. We've currently got 36 buildings being retrofitted. Parks and gardens, we have the same problem that you've been reading about in the last few days in, in Britain about the ash trees. Ours has come about uh, more directly through climate change and disease. We're going to lose 48% of our trees in the next 20 years. The reason we're going to lose them is a lot of them are very old, planted a long time ago, and we had very few species. We had plane trees, eucalypts, elms. But the other thing that's happened, this here are the, these here are the droughts. You can see we had an 11-year drought. We've never had an 11-year drought in recorded history in Australia. So we've got climate change coming through us quite severely. So what we're doing is looking at what is the future of our urban forest. We've worked out that if we want to keep the city at the same temperature as it is today, we're going to have to go from 22% canopy cover to 40% canopy cover. We have to plant 3,000 trees a year. So we've just brought into uh, uh, play an urban forest strategy. What that does, this is our water environment at the moment, and you can see where it's dropped from, and therefore water has become the new gold in Australia. These are some of the projects that we're doing to save water, and they vary from capturing it straight off the street into the trees, so you can see the water flows down this pit here into the trees, overflows back into the drain. Wherever we can, we're putting tanks in to catch stormwater. This is a World Heritage listed building, and underneath the road in front of it, we've got this tank that captures the water from the roof to reuse in the gardens. This is one of our historic gardens where we've, we've taken a depot and uh, demolished the depot, and we'll build it back at half the size, and we're putting 5 million litres of uh, stormwater catchment in there. It'll give us 67 million litres of water uh, each year, and allow us to, in fact, look after these gardens, gets us about 85% of the water we need. This is the tank going in. This is another tank underneath a road next to a garden where we catch the water upstream and purify it. And we purify it in the middle of the road. So this is the tank now being built back, and this is the rain garden in the street. And the water goes back into these gardens here. This is the largest water recapture we've got where we capture all the water from this area here. It goes through a, a pond here where it's purified. It's stored 15 million litres in there and another 6 million litres underneath this oval here. And it provides water not only for the adjacent roads but for this big park that sits next to it. So we're hoping that by the time uh, climate change starts to really bite, we'll be able to, in fact, have enough water collected to keep our trees alive. Why is it important? More people die of heat stress, and uh, sadly in 2009 we had really bad fires and we lost 173 people. And you read about those 173. The people you didn't re re read about were the 374 that died from heat-related illnesses. So it's a health issue that we're we suffering, and these are the two strategies that we've recently adopted. The urban forest, where as I say, we're going to double the canopy of our trees, and this is the open space strategy where we're increasing the open space within the central city. I want to very quickly now look at the metro area of Melbourne because I've talked about the central city and I've talked about how we've transformed that. But the challenge we've got in our city, as with a lot of American cities and, and uh, uh, African cities and Australian cities, is we overreacted to the Industrial Revolution we believed what was known as the Garden City Movement, that you could somehow live in the country and work in the city, and it's called suburbia. And this is the stuff that was built, and this is how we spend a lot of our time. This is an intersection in Melbourne. When you're building this stuff, you know you failed. There's no city in the world that's built its way out of congestion by building roads. Yet our government still persists with building roads to try and save it. If you look at the trends that are happening in our city, this is, if you Google Griffiths University vampire, you'll see for every capital city in Australia from 2001 to 2006, the stress that people are facing because of mortgage and petrol prices. 
we have in fact already got divided cities, the haves and the have-nots. If you live on the fringe, you're battling to make ends meet. You can see that because family violence is also going up in those outer areas, and there's a debate about the loss of farm farmland. In Australia, we've lost 89 million hectares of arable land to the expanded sub uh, suburbs since 1984. We, we are, in fact, paving over some of the most rich agricultural land uh, in our country. Why do we do it? Because it used to be a good investment. This is on the fringe, and if you bought a house in the fringe and you had a house in the inner city, it was only about $100,000 difference, and that's in the mid-90s. This is what's happening now. If you buy a house on the fringe, you can no longer expect to ever buy one here. So in fact, the Australian dream of buying and living, uh, uh, buying a house and slowly moving in has evaporated in the last 10 years. We're currently ex uh, experiencing what America's experienced, where a lot of mortgages are going into default, and most of them are on the fringe area. People who've bought houses, and paid 600,000 for them and are able to sell them for 325,000. So although the government has not changed its policy, the market has changed and what we're seeing in Melbourne is, and this was from a paper of just a couple of weeks ago, another bit of government propaganda, it basically showed housing prices and basically telling you that you can only afford to buy out here if you had $65,000 income. What they didn't tell you is the cost of living out there, the cost of transport, the cost of getting anywhere. The reality is that fringe is no longer affordable. The other thing that's changing in Australia is we're getting older. You can see the bump here, and these are the year, your age at the bottom. So very few young people having to look after this big bulge here of older people. And those older people are no longer choosing to go to the fringe of the city. Mom and dad and two children is the only decli declining statistic in our population at the moment. So what's happened? What we've seen is a dramatic increase in the number of apartments being built and a decline in the detached houses. People are starting to realize that it's easier to live closer to where the infrastructure is. Buildings like this have been built. All of this was fabricated in the fa factory and put up on site. Um, We've, we're getting some quite ingenious architectural solutions that are coming through um, as part of this affordability crisis we have. Yet the government has just divided another 26,000 hectares of land on our fringe. So we've really got a crisis between a government that does not understand the economy of cities and how cities work and a changing market that is starting to realize that that's failing. What we did is try to work out the cost of doing it and what we found is that uh, and this is done by a guy called Peter New uh, Newman and a few others, that if you build 1,000 houses on the fringe of the city, it's going to cost you $300 million more over 50 years than if you built 1,000 houses within the existing infrastructure of that city. What does that mean? It means if Melbourne goes from 4 million as it is today to 5 million, you'll, build 110, you'll spend $110 billion more if you put half of that on the fringe, and that's currently government policy. We're currently arguing about whether we can afford a national broadband scheme. With that money, you could buy three. So why is this important? If you're in Australia, you'll hear a constant debate about mining. Mining makes up 4% 4 4 of our GDP. Residential development makes up 8%. So if you're spending that amount of money and you get it in the wrong place and of the wrong type, it's a major impact on your economy. So what we looked at is the capacity of our city to absorb this new uh, housing. And it really took me back to a case study that I realised was happening in the 1960s in Cape Town where I went to university. As the baby boomers hit the university system, what most universities did was actually expand. In Cape Town, they had 5,000 students in 1970 on a campus designed by Herbert Baker sitting on the side of Table Mountain and they couldn't expand because they had National Park all the way around and they had this freeway to the south. So what they did is they actually assessed how they were using the stuff that they already had. And what they found is they were using lecture theatres like the one we're in tonight 17.5% of the time. So they just reprogrammed. And when I went back 30 years later, 
what I found was the student numbers had, had trebled, and they'd built a few buildings down on car parks, they'd closed one road. But the thing that I noticed was that, in fact, the, the university was vibrant from 9 o'clock in the morning till about 10, 11 at night. And the question I asked myself, well, if you can do that with a university by just reprogramming it, couldn't you do that with a city? Could you not just reprogram the city and use the stuff you've got more efficiently? So we set about to study what we could do with Melbourne. And I've got what I call the 7.5% city. And if you want to Google a much more detailed paper, you can just go to Transforming Australian Cities, Rob Adams, and, and this will come up. Basically, if you jump in a helicopter and look at Melbourne, what you'll see is around our railway stations, you'll see a change in the built form. And we've got many of these stations. We did an assessment that if you built 60% of the land in that area to maximum height of eight storeys, you would get 860,000 people within work walking distance of a railway station. That's about 3% of the metro area would be in those areas. Why is that important? Well, we've got a lot of railway stations and they're well located for transport. The next thing we looked at was the road-based public transport, the trams and buses. And we, we did an assessment of that. And what I found to my great surprise <coughs> is we had a fantastic public transport system. These are our trams in yellow and these, this is our bus system. Unfortunately, some of those buses only run once or twice a day. So we've got a very low utilisation, but the infrastructure, the road infrastructure is there. So if we could improve that, we could get a much better system. And the fact that it's a gridded system running back to that radial rail system that you saw made the coordination between the two systems very easy. So what we did is we looked at every land parcel that ran along a high utilised tram or bus route. There were 121,000 properties that sat along there and we took out the, the areas around railway stations. We took out anything that was a park, anything that was public use and industrial and you can see the number down the bottom slowly declining. If, if something didn't have rare access, we took that out so that we didn't have big black holes going into medium density uh, you know, buildings with car parks. We took out recently developed sites, we took out heritage buildings, we took out 50% of the capacity within heritage overlay areas. And we took out anything that was less than six metres. And what we ended up with was 34,000 sites that didn't have any of those sensitivities and represented about 3% of the metro area. And what we then did was apply densities to those. And if you could get a density of between 180 to 450 people on, on one of those properties, you could raise the population adjacent to public transport by one up to 2.4 million people. So what does 180 or 450 look like? This is 180. It's a three-storey building. It's not a huge building. This is the prefabricated one at 358. And this is an example in Mexico City at 349. So you could build up to eight storeys along those tram corridors and bus corridors and you could get 2.4 million people living adjacent to public transport. In Vienna, one of the most livable cities in the world, they get 900 people on, on sites. So this is not an unachievable task. And we looked at a couple of sites and said, what will that look like? This is an existing situation. You can see the expensive infrastructure, the tram line. There's the central city in the background, and you can see the nature of the built form around it. So what if? What if we actually started to put higher denser development just along those corridors? Similarly, in this road, Maribyrnong Road, and similarly here on Riversdale Road where you've got a small shopping centre. The last 1.5% came from redevelopment areas, known redevelopment areas, and we worked out that you could get about 500,000 people within those areas. So you can get 4 million people located on 7.5% of the land within our metro area. Why is that important? Because you don't have to touch suburbia. And there's a very emotional thing in our city called Save the Suburbs, and nobody wants development in the suburbs. What this study showed is you don't have to touch the suburbs. In fact, what you could do in the suburbs is put on solar voltaic panels, plant more trees, capture your water, and they would become the new green lungs of the city. So that's, in fact, the policy that we've put forward, and it's just starting to get traction with the government at the moment. There's a new paradigm, I think, about our cities, particularly cities that are suburban cities like this. And that is 
the transformational strategy that you saw happen in our central city. This is a bit of transformation happening. You don't think that man's transformed? But in fact, what our government did when they found there was congestion is they made travel before 7 o'clock in the morning free. They moved 2,600 uh, 2, people who were commuting into the central city before 7 o'clock. They saved themselves the purchase of five trains, which would cost them $100 million, and they lost 15 million in fares. And it was only a one-way fare, so these people would be paying on the way back. Retimetabling is one of the ways we're going to be able to build the infrastructure that we're going to need to accommodate that huge growth in population that I talked about earlier. Taking the road and seeing it as a piece of real estate and realizing the most inefficient way of using that road is the motor car and going to things like buses. In this road, which is a major one, there's been a long debate about whether we should have dedicated bus link routes. 32% of the people travel down this road in bus. There are more people in those buses than all the cars. So what we're slowly doing is getting people out of their cars and back into buses, something that London's doing very successfully, far more successfully than us. Why is that important? Because if people live close to public transport, they own fewer cars. So if you want to decrease congestion, improve the public transport. And I use London in my, my uh, story because the bus is an undervalued asset in Melbourne. People have a blind spot for the bus, and what's happening in London is the bus is actually be being seen as a, a solution alongside the underground. In fact, in cities like Curitiba, buses are given priority down the centre of the road. This is where Melbourne trams would usually run. If we could give the bus the same priority that we give the tram, we could very quickly increase the public transport in our city. And people who use public transport tend to walk for 41 minutes a day, whereas people who use motor cars tend to walk for seven. And obesity is costing Australia $58 billion a year. People like this would be able to get to th their local activities. How do you implement this? It's very easy. Our planning schemes have been, I think, for too long, schemes that tell us what not to do rather than what we should do. If we had a very simple planning scheme that said we want to build medium to high density along our transport systems and we don't want to build it in the areas in between, we've already done that. In one area, all we did was increase the height limit along the major public transport route. This goes up to our university. Increased the height limit and then dropped it immediately back down to two stories again. And within 10 years, we got residential along that area. So the planning scheme could start to look a bit like this. Along your public transport routes, look after your heritage. Don't build higher than the width of the street. Cut off angle to the back so you don't overshadow the property at the back. Try and get the cars in from the back so you don't disrupt the street. And a few other things. It could be a very simple strategy to improve it. The street is the most important public space of any city. Streets make up 80% of the public realm of a, a city. If you want a one-liner, the only thing you take out of here tonight, if you design a good street, you design a good city. Just think about the cities you've walked around and why you walk around those cities. It's because the streets are good public spaces. So this is the way we, we, we hope we will be going in the future. We will hope we'll have a strategy where we will build back those streets. What will it look like? This is our central city. These are our public transport routes, road-based. We hope to get the development coming along those. Why is that important? Because then the people who live between those can walk out and find employment and other activities along these streets. Even without government policy, it's happening. So if you look at our streets, and this is one of them, you can see new buildings starting to drop in. This building here is something like 200 people per hectare. It's just been completed, four stories, 14 units. And if you move down the street, you find you can hardly see it. So you don't have to lose the quality of the streetscape. Here you can see it just poking its head over, and you haven't lost any of the character of the street. These are some of the developments that are already being built. So even without government policy, developers are suddenly realizing people want to live closer to where they can get services. This is a, an affordable House that we, uh, housing that went in on a car park, uh, as you can see, adjacent to a public transport network. So there's the challenge. How do we, in fact, get people, the community, to see 
that what we're trying to do will make the future better. Unfortunately, we won't do it this way. When, we, when the architects of Australia were asked to send something called Australian Urbanism to the Venice Biennale four years ago, this is what they sent. That's enough to frighten anyone. <laughs> this was living by the sea, and this was suburbia. This is reality. <laughs> there's a tram going down the street, and there's a city in the background. What is that city going to look like in 20 years' time? It's going to look like this. It'll have more trees. There'll be solar voltaics here. And there will be five, six, or eight stories of development along here, all designed by architects. The future for you is fantastic. All of those buildings are going to need to be designed by architects. They're going to have to be affordable. They're going to have to be low energy. But it won't be a frightening future. This is not frightening. We've got to start communicating with the public in a way that they actually believe we can provide a future which they would be excited about. Thanks very much. Okay, at this point, um, Professor Adams will take a couple of questions. I have a whole list of them, but you go first. Any questions? Yeah. You seem to work in a lot of different ways as an architect, as a developer, doing the city as a you seem to work a lot with the way uh, as, uh, as an architect, as a developer, uh, as a planner. How did you arrive at such a complex way of working? For those who didn't hear the question, it was we seem to work in many ways as an architect developer um, in, in many complex ways. And the question was how did that happen? It almost happened by mistake. Uh, what happened is having written a strategy in, in 1985, the politicians said, well, will you stay on and help us implement it? And because I was running my own practice, I didn't want to get into government. I, I didn't think working in government was a prestigious thing to do. And, and I'll come back to that, because I think we need to raise the design disciplines within government. And I said I'll do that, but I don't want to be part of your existing structure. I'll be happy to be a consultant within government. And so we formed a small group with a, a landscape architect and an industrial designer and myself as an urban designer. And our job was to try and advise the other departments as to what they needed to do to adopt the strategy that we had just written. Slowly over time, they added people to us and uh, we've grown to a department now of 80 people. And we, 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 we know that we're not the planning department, there's a separate planning department. And we advise across the whole of government. We even do work for the state government. We charge our fees. We don't get a salary. We actually charge our fees for the projects we do to generate an income. So it's a very peculiar setup that I haven't seen anywhere else in any other city. But it seems to work. Because if, uh, you can still have the planning department and we provide advice to them. Uh, you can still have the engineering department and we provide advice to them. So when we change the street, the engineers will come to us and say, all right, how do we design the street so it'll be a street more for people rather than cars? So it's, a, it's quite an unusual system that they've got in the city. What it's made me realize, and I think this is important, is what happened in the 1980s is a lot of the creative people got taken out of government. Government said we can go and buy creative people. You know, if we need a creative person, we go and get a consultant and do it. What government has lost is the memory of how to, in fact, take policy and put it on the ground. Government is no longer what I call an intelligent client. And that's why I think a lot of governments have been failing, because they don't know how to write a contract, they don't even know the brief that they've got to set for a consultant. So I think one of the challenges for all of us is how do we get creative skills back into government? Because if cities are so important, you can't have governments not being you know, intelligent clients. They've got to know what they're looking for and how to procure it. And I think that's one of the big challenges. We lost it in the 1980s. I think in the next 10, 20 years, we've got to rebuild that capacity. Uh, uh, I remember uh, so much of the work planning and extensive detailing that goes behind uh, these strategies. What happens to the sociology or the organic growth of a city of the people? Is that a concern and how is it dealt with? No, I don't think it's a concern. In fact, I, I think. Um, 
that organic growth is part of actually what makes uh, cities rich. Um, I, I think one of the big challenges we've got, and we've got a dockland that's pretty much like your docklands here, and had I shown you that, um, it's not as impressive as the rest of the city. Um, they've built a lot of big stuff. Uh, and what they haven't done is allow some of that small organic growth that people enjoy, and, and you know, the cafes, the restaurants, and the little, you know, creative enterprises. So, um, I think one of the challenges is how do, you, how do you get that small stuff into new development? Because the, the system that drives uh, our society at the moment is big finance. And big finance is incredibly simplistic. They'd rather go and build a single-use building and lend them a lot of money. And if you come with you know, a complex brief where we say we're going to have a few of these and a few of those, they're not interested. So, Again, I come back to this question. I think governments have to do it. I think uh, you know they've got to get back into the business of taking redevelopment sites, breaking them up into small and big sites. You know, having some of those sites sold cheaply so you can get smaller development into, it, as well as the big development. And that's that's not an easy thing to do, but I think it is doable. Uh, that, that site we bought in the middle of the city, we did that quite simply by just saying, look. We want a childcare centre, you know, we don't want the whole thing designed by many architects, uh, by one architect, we want many architects. And it's not 100% there, but it's slightly better, I think, than had it just been put out to the market without those controls. Um, hello there. I'm glad you mentioned documents because it is the one part of the world that just doesn't seem to work at all. I know. With no quantity, young architects to try and find a way to bring life to the project. It was a few years ago, and it seems to have a fundamental uh, problem. So I think your book says absolutely right. I wonder if you could say one bit more about the different types of uses that might come in as well. Because it's not just about housing, it's not just about obviously sure. residential units as well. And one of the things that makes South America so good is the role of universities. And Sure. Another organization. I just wonder if you could just talk about that side of the architecture. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, in fact, Melbourne is a university city, uh, and, and we don't call ourselves that, but we've got nine universities downtown, um, and, and two of those are major universities, you know, right uh, almost in the centre of it. So, 40, 40 odd percent of the inner city population are students, uh, and, and that's huge vitality that's come to our, our city. So while I've talked a little bit about uh, you know, the, the physical part of the city, some of the other strategies that came through at the same time were an event strategy, where we went out actively to go and get events to bring them to the city to attract people back downtown. The arts and culture, uh, we give more money to the arts than any other local government in the whole of Australia. And that's, you know, young artists, we've got a thing called Art Bay, where we, a tiny little building, the one with the white roof that uh, I showed you painted there, where we bring primary school children together with artists uh, so that they, they actually get to appreciate um, the importance of the creative disciplines, uh, many of which are undervalued, I think, in our society. Um, so, you know, the arts and culture is big. Sport. Uh, I was absolutely amazed by how Melbourneians turn out to sport. I reckon you could have a game of Teddy Wins and you'd get 3,000 people in the town. I mean, they had a game of rugby. And they don't play rugby down in this part of the country, they play Aussie rules. 80,000 people turned up to watch this game between New Zealand and Australia. And I reckon about 60,000 didn't know the rules. So, you know, they, they, they're a very participatory culture. They, they just like to get out there and do stuff. So it, it's, it's very mixed. We've got good entertainment, good sport, uh, as I say, nine universities. So, and a, a hugely diverse population, something like 240 different nationalities. Uh, so it's very much like, uh, I suppose, America from that point of view, very socially diverse uh, characteristics, which means you get different areas of Italian restaurants and Spanish restaurants and, you know, Mexican and, uh, you know, we've got a little area called Little Vietnam. And it, it actually occurs in Victorian architecture, it's that lovely, Overlay between Vietnam and the uh, Victorian architecture. Um, what's quite interesting is how you've outlined the kind of, a kind of joined up thinking that's also based in kind of pragmatism in, in, in Melbourne, and it has completely changed and transformed the city. But one of the questions is, is that also. Because I'm originally from 
come up. I do still notice that there's kind of undercurrents of resistance and opposition. And, and, and that's also, you know, emphasised in a way by the absolute resistance to the question of climate change by people like Tony Abbott and the, and the Conservatives there. So there, there's a kind of, sometimes the, the this, it, it doesn't quite always mix that yeah. well. And I'm just interested to hear some of the, you know, of how, how do you overcome the opposition? Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I leave climate change because I think that's, that's complex and I think, uh, you know, I still can't believe that people don't believe in climate change. So, but, and, and Tony Abbott does. Um, but the, the, the other one about that undercurrent, I think a lot of people look at banners and, and architects and think we failed them. There's still a lot of very bad development that goes on. And the other thing that happens, which I think is, is, is uh, unfortunate, is we set rules and then we break them. So, you know, we had a recent case in Melbourne where there was a 100 metre height limit and across the road was 120 metres. And they said it was discretionary. Well, along came an architect in the 100 metre height zone, designed a building 225 metres. And the government gave them a permit. And, you know, I actually took it to the land court because I said, look, I don't know where discretion is. If I'm sitting the other side of the road and I'm in 120, I would have thought discretion would stop before you got to 120. How can you get to 225? And they got it on the basis of good architect. But what happened is that permit came back in three months later and the architect was stripped out by the second developer. So I think one of the challenges we've got is how do we keep faith with the public? How do we convince them that if we're going to look at the city, and let's say we take that uh, approach that I've shown you tonight, if we're going to do that, how do we win back faith and say we won't change it halfway through? If we say we're just going to build along those corridors, we won't jump into the residential areas. So I think we've got to rebuild uh, trust between planners, urban designers, architects, and the community. And that will only come slowly by doing good architecture and good urbanism. And I think that's the road that Melbourne's trying to hope now. Uh, but it's difficult with governments. I mean, you, you get a change of government and they're on a very short tenure. And some of them just don't realise how important that consistency of treatment is. Uh, I don't know how you get around that. That's democracy. But I think that's part of the problem with that. Climate change, uh, we can you know, I, I, I think it's almost undeniable now uh, to anybody who's, uh, you know, even looks at any of the facts. Um, I think in the next five years, um, you know, uh, we'll wonder why we didn't all believe in it. Uh, we can see our climate changing so quickly. Uh, you know, to lose the trees we're losing in Australia at the moment through disease as well as low water regimes is quite frightening. Starts to mean you're going to get that, that investment back in the existing infrastructure. 
And I think over the next 10, 20 years, it's going to happen naturally because younger people do not want to live, you know, an hour and a half's drive away from where they work. They're actually tweeting at the moment on travel times, and it took one guy an hour and a half to go between two suburbs one morning. You know, people are not prepared to do that. Anymore. Um, at the moment in the UK and in London, uh, there's a lot of cuts going on, especially for the sort of strategic urban work that, that you're doing in Melbourne. I don't know if there's a similar situation going on there. No, there are plenty of money in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems. Uh, so it seems. I don't know. What, what would your message be, perhaps, or, or any advice? Yeah, well, look, sad, sadly, at the moment, the current state government that's coming to Victoria is a conservative government. And they are cutting people out of uh, the planning departments. They've just uh, dropped uh, 200 engineers uh, out of the road department. One might say that's not a bad thing. But um, I think it's, you know, it's such a short term, say, you know, for, for one budget, you might say, you know, a couple of million dollars by dropping those people up. But what you lose is that intellect for a long period of time. I don't know when governments are going to actually start to realise that um, investment in intellect is, is their real strength for the future. Um, they just don't seem to get it. Uh, you know, you, you saw the possibility of what might have, might have happened in America uh, in the last couple of days. What would have happened? if the Conservatives got back in and started stripping all that stuff out of it. We've got to get into long-term thinking about our cities. We've got to, in fact, put intelligent people in places where they can, in fact, make a difference. And governments need to invest in people, not actually get rid of them. I don't know how you get that message through. Um, I think, hopefully, by you know, more and more people talking about the importance of cities and realizing that, uh, you know, maybe if we had a minister for cities, you know, why have we got a minister for transport, hospitals, education, police? But nobody actually coordinates how cities come together. And if someone had to think about how cities come together as a ministerial portfolio, maybe they'd start thinking about it in a slightly different way. And that's the message we're trying to do at the, at the World Economic Forum. Start to actually think seriously about cities. Nation states are mostly a thing of the past. We're back to most city states. So I think we're going to have to reinvest in some of those services, but not all of them. 
And I think the difficult ones will be things like sewage and water and gas. Yep. Um, just adding on to the question, I guess I'm quite sorry about um, uh, intensifying along rail corridors and transport corridors in England and not situation and seeing what happens there in terms of higher density or intensifying density. Um, but I guess it's also uh, a question of how you increase the efficiency of those tram lines. Sure. Uh, and also, what I'm excited about is that level, next level of loop-based systems that yeah. we are not doing right now. Yeah. The, the, the question is, is an important one. Um, if you do build along those corridors, and particularly if you have trams running along them, how do you make the tram system more efficient? Because at the moment what's happening in a lot of our streets is the trams are competing with cars. So the tram can only go as fast as the queue of cars in front of it and they're sharing the same space. I think what's going to happen and what's happened in the main street of our city is you're going to start to segregate those out. In the streets where you have trams running, you won't have cars running. They'll have to, in fact, go to other streets. And even if that only happens during the peak traveling hours, early morning and, and, and evening, you'll have to give the priority in public transport. And that's the way it should be. And they're carrying you know, more people than the cars that carry. So I suppose the, the thing we should be talking about is not how many vehicles go past the point, but how many people go past the point. And that way you'll give preference to trams and buses and bicycles and pedestrians. And the motor car will actually not operate in those streets. It's going to be the only way we can do it. Um, That's right. And, and you know, in the morning what they're doing in, in, in tram streets is you can't have any parking on that street early in the morning. So you get extra space on the road for cyclists and cars so they don't uh, interrupt the tram. So it, it comes down to timetable. Uh, you know, and it's not a difficult thing to do. You don't have to go and build more stuff. You just got to be uh, smarter about the stuff you've already got. Yeah. I think I have to draw it to the last question. I mean, there are so many questions. I'm sure there are more questions out there. Um, our dean is very keen on multidisciplinary sort of learning and teaching and learning and exchange of knowledge. You earlier on, this before your lecture at T, you spoke about you know you want to reorganize your office to encourage more of the multidisciplinary kind of interaction. Could you actually elaborate that? Sure. When we started, we were a very small team, there were five of us. We had an industrial designer, a landscape architect, uh, an urban designer, one admin person, and an architect, I think, the five like that. And what we did is every project, we all looked at the project and, and made our contribution. As we got bigger, those disciplines started to break up into teams. And what I've noticed is I don't think our work's that good uh, uh, anymore. Um, I actually think the teams have started to actually do what teams do. They start to actually talk to themselves rather than talk to the other disciplines. So at the moment, I'm actually breaking the teams apart. Uh, there will be no more team leaders. Uh, there will be no more architects, branch, landscape. We're just going to have a studio. And in fact, everybody will, we will still have the disciplines and the heads of disciplines, but we will, at the start of every year, we will negotiate the people who are going to work on a project so that we get that cross-disciplinary uh, action. It's something that I think has made our work exciting and I hadn't realized that as we got better, bigger we were slowly losing it. So we're reverting back to that multidisciplinary uh, view. You all know, it, you know, you work on a project and then someone who hasn't been working on a project from a different discipline comes along and says, so why are you doing it that much? I think the healthiest thing is to have that cross-disciplinary uh, approach to design. So that's the way we've worked in the past and uh, as we've got bigger we've sort of lost it now. I just said to CJ before, I'm actively trying to re reorganize it so that we get it back. I'll tell you how it goes in two years' time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very, very exciting because um, well, the, the bottom has seven key schools uh, or departments and you know, it's, it would be really exciting that we can actually have that kind of interaction that you have in your office or before you know, your sort of architects and the landscape branches. Yeah, yeah. And I think that would be very exciting. And I think possibly the success of your projects is also from the very tiniest idea of like installing the flower cellar there till 11 o'clock at night to the mega, mega sort of thinking that you have to the internal sort of sustainable sort of energy strategies that you have for your CH, uh, 
access to development. The set success and broad, versatile thinking comes from multidisciplinary work. It does. It also comes from a philosophy that um, urban design for me is not only about the design, but it's about the management of the public space. Because so many spaces you see have been designed and then people walk away from them. And, and you know, they sit there in an embarrassed state and don't work. So we realized fairly early on that you know, it wasn't just the designing of the space, but putting in place a management system so those spaces could actually develop. And a number of our spaces we've, we've designed at a minimal level, and then in fact seen how people have used them and adjusted them. Uh, the city square that I showed you, that everybody's sitting on the grass. The grass wasn't there originally. We designed it, and we, we, we had the Berlin exam, the cafes, and restaurants, and we just noticed that not a lot of people were sitting. And uh, we went back a few years later and just put that triangle on the grass, and suddenly the people came. So, for me, you know, public space is a, a difficult thing. If you don't get it right first time, you must be better off starting with less of the space and being able to add in as you see how people use it rather than putting everything in first and then finding half of this in here. So uh, it's very much for us uh, living the city, uh, you know, not only designing it but observing it, seeing how it's used and just tweaking it if we have to. Rob, thank you very much for an inspirational lecture. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm sure that was only a short version. We, could, we really should get you here for a long version of it. But thank you very much. I really, really honored to have you.